Tell you what, we're going to continue our series of lessons through the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, our, our, our overall theme this year is um, um, questions that are frequently asked. And, you know, we started out the year, uh, people ask questions, and, and I just did sermons to answer those questions. And then uh, questions started coming about the end of time and what's going to happen when... Uh, uh, Jesus comes back again, and you know, do you think we're close to the rapture, and all those kind of things that crop up every time something happens over in the Middle East that make people think about what the Bible says about the second coming of Christ, and so I told you we would just, just kind of take a highlight journey through the book of Revelation, and that's what we've been doing. Today we're in chapter 8, we're going to start with verse number 1, and in this chapter, the Lamb, who is Jesus, opens the seventh seal on a seven-sealed scroll that the Lamb took from the hand of God. And in that scroll, every time one of the seals is opened, another role that Jesus plays in the unfolding drama of human history is revealed. The book of Revelation reveals Jesus as the one who is in complete control of human history, regardless of what the devil tries to do about it. Regardless of what evil men try to do about it, Jesus is in complete control of everything that happens as human history unfolds. After all, in the first verse of the first chapter of this book, it is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything in the book reveals something about Jesus. And so we begin today in Revelation chapter 8, verse number 1, which says, When he opened the seventh seal... There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Let's pray. Father, I thank you because you're good and you're kind and you're gracious. You've given us your word. You've told us to study from it. You've told us to read it. You've told us to memorize it and meditate on it. And you've told us, Father, that your word contains the ability to help us see life the way you do and then respond the way you would. Father, help us to gain that kind of wisdom from your word today. Help us to see Jesus maybe in a little newer light than we've ever seen him before and be impacted by him who opens this seventh seal. I pray that in Jesus' name and for his sake, and amen. Now, in Revelation chapter 5, we saw the lamb, that was Jesus, holding a scroll with seven seals on it. In chapter 6, we watched as the Lamb opened six of the seven seals. The opening of each seal revealed a particular role Jesus will play in this unfolding drama of human history. In chapter 7, we learned of two brief interludes between the opening of the sixth and the seventh seals, the second of which, the second of those interludes, depicted glory believers around the throne of God in heaven who have been raptured out of great tribulation. So by the time we get to the end of chapter 7, the rapture has happened. Jesus has come and snatched his people away from planet earth prior to the time of wrath where he begins to pour out his wrath on the planet because the scriptures clearly tell us that if we are believers in Jesus, we have been delivered from the wrath to come. And so prior to that time of wrath, um, Jesus snatches his people away. Now, I want to tell you this, the word rapture is not used anywhere in your Bible. Um, I had a young woman tell me one time, ah, you don't preach the truth, you're preaching about a rapture, and that word ain't in the Bible anywhere. And she's right, it is not, that word is not in the Bible anywhere. But the, the um, Greek word that means to be snatched away or to be pulled away is in there. We get our word rapture from the Latin translation of that word, uh, where the Roman Catholics translated the Bible into Latin for use in Roman Catholic churches in the early centuries. And, and that word is raptos in Latin. And from that word, we get the word rapture. So the concept of a rapture, the concept of raptos, the concept of being snatched away is definitely in the Bible. Regardless of what word you use to describe it, the, the fact remains that Jesus is going to come back someday and pull his people out of planet earth prior to the unfolding of the horrors of judgment that come on the world during the last three and a half years 
of the tribulation period. Then in chapter 8, the chapter we're looking at today, we will see the Lamb open the seventh seal on the scroll. When he does so, there's a sudden 30-minute span of silence in heaven. That's what John wrote about in the verse we just read. When he, the Lamb, opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. That silence is likely the result of the wonder of God fulfilling his plan to rescue believers from eternal death and to get them to heaven where they are experiencing eternal life to the fullest degree around the throne of God. My friend, it is a wonder. It is the wonder of wonders that God could rescue sinful mankind from the consequences of sin. That God came up with a plan where he could maintain his justice and at the same time offer mercy to sinners. And so when that plan reaches its fulfillment, when it is finally concluded, and all of the human race who have ever believed in this Messiah of the Jews, in this Jesus of Nazareth of the New Testament, in this one who is the Word become flesh, God in human flesh, of wonders when it's all completed suddenly those myriads of believers around the throne joined by myriads of angels around the throne of God are so overwhelmed by that that they're speechless and they're silence in heaven for about 30 minutes and then the action begins suddenly the silence is broken the opening of the seventh seal brings the appearance of seven angels who are given seven trumpets. John wrote, this is in verse number 2 of Revelation 8, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God. These are evidently seven specific angels who have been summoned to stand before God, awaiting an assignment from him to launch specific forms of judgment on the Christ-rejecting population of planet Earth after the rapture during that final three and a half years of the tribulation period. And it says, and seven trumpets were given to them. So you got seven angels standing there waiting for an assignment, and then God begins to hand each one of them a trumpet. In ancient history, in fact, throughout ancient history, trumpets were used by armies as a communication system. Certain blast of the trumpet signal meant that a certain blast of the trumpet signaled strategic military commands to the soldiers. And as we shall see, when each angel sounds his trumpet, it signals the arrival of a specific form of judgment to begin. And then the next scene in John's vision depicts the appearance of yet another angel who was evidently sent by God to answer the prayers of God's people throughout the ages who are now in heaven. you got all these redeemed people around the throne in heaven. And throughout their lifetimes, they have been praying all kinds of prayers. But one specific prayer that certain generations prayed more than other generations is that God would take vengeance on their enemies. The people of God have been oppressed, they have been uh, ridiculed, they have been slaughtered, they have been murdered, they have been enslaved. All kinds of things have happened to the people of God all down through the ages and, and through those horrible times of oppression of the church, God's people have cried out for vengeance against their enemies. And God's going to answer all those prayers at this scene in the Revelation. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. And that tells us that evidently the throne room of God and the Lamb in heaven has many of the same furnishings of, as the tabernacle and later the temple of the Old Testament. There was an altar there where there was incense to be burned. That was in the tabernacle. That was in the temple. That's here in this throne room of God in heaven as well. And it says he was given much incense to offer. Incense is finely ground spices that when burned produce an aromatic smoke that drifts upward. And it says he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. In the Old Testament tabernacle and temple, the Priests would go in every day and they would burn incense on that golden incense altar. And as those, as those 
the aromatic smoke of that burning incense went up. It was a representation. It was a picture. It was a visual aid. It was a reminder to the ancient Israelis that their prayers were continually going up before God. On the other side of the curtain was God, the God of epic proportions, hovering between the two cherubim, the two angels on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And that smoke, that aromatic smoke representing the prayers of God's people would, would rise and drift over that curtain into the nostrils of the God of all of the universe, telling the people of Israel that they should never stop praying. They should continually pray because God hears the prayers of his people. James in the New Testament said it like this. He said that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. My friend, I don't care how dark the day gets, how bad the circumstances are, or how joyous the day is, and how good the circumstances are, we should always continue to pray. And we see here that one of the primary reasons for that is God answers prayer. He might not answer the prayer when we want him to answer it. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and say, oh, why God didn't do anything about that? He probably did. Well, there's no doubt he did something about it. You know, God always answers prayer. You say, he doesn't answer mine. He really does. Sometimes he says yes to your prayer, and he does it right now. Sometimes he says no, because what you're asking for is stupid. You don't realize it, but he does. And then sometimes he says, yeah, I'm going to do that, but not yet. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, and sometimes he says wait. And then this is one of those occasions where people have been for generations crying out for vengeance against their enemies, and God said, yeah, I'm going to do that, but just wait. And this is the time when he decides it's the perfect time to do it. And so look at this. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. So what's happening here? God's answering that prayer for vengeance. And God is about to start pouring out vengeance on the people of planet earth who have rejected him, been left behind after the rapture and answer to the prayers of his people throughout the ages. But I want to show you something about the people of God here. If they do what God wants them to, they don't take vengeance into their own hands. They've prayed and asked God to take vengeance, and God will. He said in the book of Hebrews, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense. So we're not supposed to take vengeance. We're supposed to cry out to the one who will ultimately take vengeance against our enemies. The next scene in John's vision is a warning of coming judgment. Coming judgment on the post-rapture population of planet Earth during the final three and a half years of the tribulation period. Now, we might have some new folks here today, so let me give you a little, I keep mentioning tribulation period. We're living in what's called the church age. One of these days, the church age will end because Jesus is going to pull the church out of here when he comes back again. That rapture is going to happen. And there's a seven-year period of intense tribulation on planet Earth divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods. The first three-and-a-half years is not that bad. The second three-and-a-half years is horrible. The Lord raptures his people out of here right about three-and-a-half years in before the day of his wrath begins. And then you got that three-and-a-half years of horrible, intense judgment, God pouring out his vengeance against the Christ-rejecting population of this planet after the rapture and then after that three and a half years at the end of the seven year tribulation period jesus comes back again with his people and sets up a 1000 year kingdom right here on planet earth you can read about that at the end of the revelation at the end of that thousand years the present heavens and the present earth are burned up and there's a new heaven and a new earth and forever and ever and ever we are with jesus on the new earth surrounded by the new heaven. That's just kind of an overview of the epics of time that are going to come as we near closer and closer to the end of this age. And so when I talk about the tribulation period, you can understand what I'm talking about. So this is what John wrote in Revelation 8, 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumbling, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. That's going to be a pretty astounding end to the silence 
don't you think? When he, when he hurls this fire from the altar to the earth, and suddenly there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Thunderstorms and earthquakes have been viewed throughout ancient history as expressions of God's judgment. This scene obviously re reveals Jesus, the God of the Old Testament, living in human flesh in the New Testament. He re it reveals Jesus as answering the prayers of his people for vengeance against their enemies by judging them. He said this, Jesus himself said this in John 5, to 23. Most people miss this. This is what it says. The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Do you get that? It's not God the Father who judges. Who is it that's revealed in this revelation as the judge? It's Jesus. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is judging the Christ-rejecting population of planet Earth, particularly for their, in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, particularly for the way they have ill-treated the people of God. He's taken vengeance on them because of that. It's not the Father doing it. This isn't the revelation of the Father. This is the revelation of Jesus. And so John had explained that. That the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. And why does God judge? Why does, why does the Son judge? That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Some people say, I believe in God, but I don't believe in this Jesus. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. Because Jesus of the New Testament is God of the Old Testament, living in human flesh. You either believe what the Bible says about him or you don't believe at all. It's pretty simple. And God wants us to honor the Son just like we honor the Father. These scenes of judgment depict Jesus as the judge in the drama of human history. After all, as I've said again and again, and as John put it, in Revelation 1.1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, let's see what happens when these first four angels sound their trumpets. Um, God has thrown this fire from the golden altar to the earth, and all kinds of judgment uh, is, is looming on the horizon. There are these, these peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake, all of those things just, just signaling the impending coming of judgment. And immediately, after the scene depicting the coming of the judgment of the Lamb on the inhabitants of earth, the angels prepared to sound their trumpets. And every time one of them sounds, judgment is poured out. John wrote it like this in Revelation 8, 6. The seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. And as we shall see, with the sounding of each trumpet, a new phase of the Lamb's judgment is un unleashed on planet earth so let's look at angel number one when the first angel sounded his trumpet judgment was heaped on mankind in the form of not a natural disaster but a supernatural disaster we're kind of used to natural disasters right by the way who's in control of those the lamb He's in control of everything. He's the Lord. He's the master. He created all of it. He can control it and use it according to his plan and his purpose. So there are natural disasters, but this one is a supernatural disaster, destroying one-third of Earth's vegetation. John wrote it like this in verse 7. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. Now let's examine that. A hailstorm would be a natural disaster, right? But what about a hailstorm including fire mixed with blood? Would that be a natural disaster? That would be a supernatural disaster. That is something that God has designed and orchestrated that are beyond the limits of nature. It's not a natural disaster. This is a supernatural disaster designed by Jesus to judge the planet after the rapture. And it was hurled down on earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. 
When one-third of the vegetation of the planet is destroyed, guess what happens? Let's use a little reasoning. Let's use a little scientific information. What happens when one-third of the vegetation on the planet is burned up? One-third of our oxygen supply will be eliminated because plants absorb carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen in a process called photosynthesis. When one-third of the plants are gone, one-third of our oxygen supply is gone. With one-third of the oxygen supply diminished, there will be widespread respiratory distress. We think COVID-19 was bad. We ain't seen nothing yet. Do you get that? This is the lamb judging the Christ-rejecting population of earth after the rapture. Angel number two. When the second angel sounded his trumpet, judgment was unleashed that destroyed one-third of Earth's sea life and one-third of mankind's shipping capacity. I hope that didn't happen anytime soon, don't you? We got shipping problems now, don't we? Can't get stuff transported from one place to another. Think about one-third of the shipping capacity of the planet being destroyed. It will plunge the global economy into chaos. John wrote this in verses 8 and 9 of Revelation chapter 8. The second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. I was in a class one time studying through this and read that section, the, the, the instructor did. Something like a huge mountain all ablaze fell into the sea. And some very analytical thinking student raised his hand and asked the professor, what was it? It just says here it was like a huge mountain ablaze. What was it? And the professor said, just give me a second and I'll explain to you what it was. There was a silence in the class. Everybody wanted to know. And he said it was something like a huge mountain all ablaze. You see, God didn't tell us what it was. But he told us what it looked like. Does it matter what it was? No, what matters is what was the effect? What happened when this thing was hurled into the sea? And so something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea turned into blood. This is judgment on the plant's saltwater oceans. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Think about that. A third of all sea life dies. And th that, that's going to affect our food supply, isn't it? And then a third of the ships were destroyed. That's going to destroy a third of the shipping industry. Think of the stench and the potential of disease that would develop as millions of tons of sea life washed ashore along the beaches of every coastal nation on the planet. Think how horrible that's going to be. And then, and then the shipping industry disrupted to the point that food can't be shipped from one place to another on the planet. Angel number three. When the third angel sounded his trumpet, judgment in the form of the poisoning of a third of Earth's fresh water supplies was unleashed. Get that. One third of the fresh water supplies of planet Earth poisoned, causing widespread human death due to the consumption of this contaminated water. John wrote about it in Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. The third angel sounded his trumpet. And a great star blazing like a torch. It, it, it would have looked much like a meteorite. The same thing as the mountain that looked like a mountain blazing. We don't know what it was. But it was something that to John looked like a, a great star blazing like a torch. It would have looked to him much like a, a meteorite that we call a falling star. It fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Those are man's fresh water supplies. The name of the star is Wormwood. 
In ancient literature, wormwood referred to a poisonous plant, the oil from which was used to kill intestinal worms in people and animals. They used it medicinally. However, ingesting more than just a few drops of it was fatal. It was poisonous. And so what they're saying about a third of Earth's fresh water supplies is that they are going to be contaminated and become poisonous when men consume them. And as a result, a third of the waters are turned bitter. They're turned poisonous. And many people died from the water that had become bitter. Sounded kind of bad, right? Angel number four. When the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, Earth's population is judged when the Lamb diminishes one-third of the light shining from the sun and the stars. John wrote this. This is in Revelation 8, 12. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. The sun and the stars produce... At this point, only two-thirds of the light energy they normally produce. You get that? Instead of the sun, which is a massive ball of helium burning at the center of our solar system, our planets rotate around it, orbit around it, it provides all kinds of energy for planet Earth. It provides light. It provides warmth. It is responsible for regulating our temperature. And it also has a huge effect on the growth of plants, the health of animals, even the health of human beings. And when a third of the energy source from the sun and evidently all the other stars, you realize that our sun is a star. It just happens to be the star around which planet Earth rotates. There are millions of other stars out there. And a third of them are going to cease or all of them are going to cease to burn as brightly as they did prior to this judgment. In fact, one-third less. The amount of light shining on earth both during the day and the night is reduced by one-third. This judgment will produce drastic cataclysmic changes to earth's weather, our energy consumption, agriculture, and even human health. One third less sunlight will mean widespread vitamin D deficiencies among human beings. You realize that your body produces vitamin D when you get enough sunlight. If you don't get enough sunlight, you get a vitamin D deficiency, and that results in the loss of bone density in humans that will cause the skeletal system of people to deteriorate, and broken bones will happen when they should not happen. It's another judgment of the Lamb against the Christ-rejecting population of the earth during that horrible time of God's wrath. Now let's look at the conclusion. Revelation chapter 8 closes with a scene during which John is warned that as severe as the first six seal judgments and the first four trumpet judgments have been, there are coming three trumpet judgments that will be even more severe. Well, that, you think that was encouraging to John? When Jesus says, you think it's been bad up till now? You ain't seen nothing yet. Three more trumpet judgments to come that are more severe than what you've already seen. John wrote about it. He said this in Revelation 8, 13. As I watched... I heard an angel, or excuse me, an eagle that was flying in midair. The, the, the Greek word translated eagle there literally refers to a carrion vulture. You know what a carrion vulture is? It's a particular kind of vulture that eats the carcasses of dead animals. You've probably seen them and just didn't know what they were. When you see a dead animal on the highway... And you see these big black birds that are eating it? The bigger ones are carrion vultures. They eat the deteriorating corpses, flesh, animals, and even humans. And so John watched, and, and one of those carrion vultures is flying in mid-air. And that makes sense that it would be a carrion vulture. 
considering the vast numbers of people and animals that will die during these previous judgments. And he, and he called out in a loud voice, supernatural too, right? A carry-on vulture that can talk. He called out in a loud voice, Woe! 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 To the inhabitants of the earth. The Greek word translated woe literally means cursed. He's pronouncing an even greater curse on the, uh, the population of planet earth and what they've already experienced. And I want you to see here clearly that this judgment is not intended to be a direct judgment on the environment of earth itself, even though the environment of earth is included, is used by God, by Jesus for this judgment. Who is the target? The inhabitants of the earth. The Christ-rejecting portion of planet Earth that's left here after the rapture during those last three and a half years of tribulation. And he's, he's pronouncing this curse on them because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So it's even worse. Each one of these next three is a curse all on its own. That's why he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's three. And there are three more trumpets yet to sound. As severe, I want to give you this now, as severe as the coming judge judgments that we're reading about may be for unbelievers on earth. Anybody doubt that this is going to be pretty severe? As severe as that may be for the unbelievers left here, their judgment in the lake of fire that we read about at the end of the Revelation will be unimaginably worse. John described the environment in the lake of fire when he wrote this. It's in Revelation 20, verse 10. Uh, some excerpts from that verse. He wrote, the devil who deceived them. Why do people not believe in Jesus? Because the devil deceives them. The devil didn't want them to believe in Jesus. Misery loves company. He knows he's defeated. He knows that he's going to wind up in the lake of fire. And he wants to take everybody with him that he can possibly take. Some people say, I'm just too intelligent, just too sophisticated. I, I believe that Jesus myth. What you are is you are deceived by the devil. And you're right, brother, pride enters into that. But we are deceived by the devil because he wants to destroy you. He wants to kill and steal and destroy. Jesus is the source of eternal life. The devil wants you to experience eternal death. Jesus is the way to get to the, to the new earth surrounded by the new heaven and live in blissful glory forever. And listening to the lies of the devil will get you into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur forever and ever and ever and ever and so that's what he says the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur they will be tormented and that's a greek word describing unbearable pain they will be tormented day and night forever and ever no relief no break no easing up for all eternity there will be this torment in the lake of fire for those who refuse to believe in Jesus because they prefer, for whatever reason, to believe the lie of the devil. Now, I want to tell you this. The only way to avoid those horrific judgments on earth and the unimaginable torment of the lake of fire is to stop believing the lie of the devil and start believing Jesus. Particularly, you need to believe what we call the Jesus story. This is what Jesus said about this issue in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him, whoever believes this Jesus story, shall not perish. You won't wind up in the lake of fire. Shall not perish but have eternal life. You have to believe the Jesus story in order to escape the horrible judgment of the Lamb during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. You have to believe the Jesus story in order to escape that eternal judgment that's coming on mankind who refuse to believe in Jesus for all eternity. You've got to believe the story. 